Today, y'all, we have just keep being more and more fortunate. We have one of the best guitar players on the planet. And your new guitarist in Motley Crue, I am so excited to talk to John Five today. Truly one of the greats. It's amazing to have you on. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Well, you know, we like to walk through people's lives and careers and journey through music. You're so experienced. I like to learn from the guests. And I know you have so many amazing stories to share. Um, so you were originally from Michigan. You kind of grew up out there. Yes, I was born in Michigan. And it was, you know, a lot of people had like, oh, I had such a tough life. I had a great life. I grew up on the lake and everything like that. But um, I started playing like nightclubs and everything like early on, like, even like, I think it was my earliest was like sixth grade. Right. And because I started playing guitar at such an early age and I would play all these clubs and then um, seventh, eighth grade and ninth grade. And my mom, who was so cool, she said, as long as you get up for school, you can play these clubs because, you know, you go on at like a thousand o'clock. Right. So, you know, that alarm went off and I had to get up and um that was that was the that was the rule because she knew I didn't drink or anything like that so it was great but yeah I was um did that and I moved to Los Angeles drove out to Los Angeles with the drummer from Megadeth actually uh Chuck who played on so far so good so what and I moved out to um Los Angeles on how old were you at that point I just turned 18 well, I want to, I, I want to, before you get 18, because I, I know that a lot of this was your formative years. So, you know, first of all, when did you figure out like, man, I want to start playing guitar. What really got you into that? I've read that a lot of bluegrass had a lot of influence on you. Yeah. I, I loved, um, he Hawk. I, I just loved TV. Right. And I, I just really enjoyed, uh, anything with music on TV, um, and, you know, the Brady Bunch, because they, they had some music, and, and uh, Happy Days, they had music. Oh, and, and then I saw Hee Haw, and it was all music, so I was obsessed. And that's where I said to myself, oh, I want to play guitar. And I saw this little kid playing banjo, and he was just, you know, all that cool stuff. And I was like, oh, cool. So that's why I played Telecasters, because of uh, Hee Haw and, um, and all that stuff. And I just thought it was the only electric guitar there was. That's so amazing. And, yeah. and he has like a satirical kind of comedy style show as well. Uh, I've seen some of that. I loved Happy Days. I used to watch yeah. all the reruns of that. <laughs> so cool. Uh, so what was like the first concert you ever went to? My first show was 1981. I was 11 years old and it was Iggy Pop, Santana, and the Rolling Stones. Wow, dude. It was, I was in a stadium and I was like, oh, wow. I was so young, I didn't understand. And then Iggy Pop came out. I was like, that's not the Rolling Stones. And he like, you know, like put peanut butter all over himself and was walking on the crowd. I was like, oh my God. So Iggy Pop was the actual first person I ever saw in concert. And, um, but I loved the Rolling Stones at that point, you know? So uh, yeah, it was great. It was a wonderful first concert. It was all downhill from there. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't think so, but uh <laughs> You know, so you were able to play in these adult bars as a kid. I, th I think that's so cool. I, I just want to reflect on how cool your parents were, that they were very supportive of yeah. you. And it, it really sounds like that's a fair deal. Like, you know, you get good grades, you can pursue your dream. And yeah. um, I'm, I'm sure they know that that has worked out very well. So major parenting W for them. It was wonderful. I didn't get the best of grades, that's for sure. But I didn't <laughs> smoke or drink or right. do any drugs or anything like that and i think that's what was important because i think they knew that early on i was so interested in music just like you know uh, a lot of um kids growing up they know what their what their kids want to do and i was so driven i it was absurd how driven i was so i don't think they were that concerned about the grades because they weren't like well where are you going to go to college and or anything <laughs> like that so they kind of knew what was going to happen. Well, and, and I, I think as well, what I'd like to ask people, for you to be as elite as you are in the guitar, like mind-blowing good, it's not as if I think, or maybe I'm wrong, maybe it came natural to you, but it seems like it's an extreme amount of prep preparation and a lot of practice that other people weren't willing to spend the time doing. I have tried to learn to play the guitar, and for me, I'm like, this is really hard, and my brain's not wired that way, whatever. But what do you think it was that was really 
you were so driven to to not just get good at the guitar, but get at a really high level? I think what it was is I loved, when I was a kid, I loved anyone that did anything to the to their pinnacle, to the extreme. Yes. If it was riding a BMX bike or someone in sports or someone in music or something, I really loved that. And I was just, I loved all the greats. And that's not out of the ordinary, but I really studied like theory because I never wanted, I never thought I was going to be a, I can't even say rock star. I never thought I was going to be a professional musician. I always thought I was going to be a session player because I thought a professional musician was, you know, it just was like I was, you know, it is too out of my dreams. It is like impossible. Right. On so I studied music and I studied playing because I wanted to be a session player. And um, that's all I did with my days. Like eight hours a day was study, study, study books and theory and scales and different styles of music. And um, because I had a plan so early on when I went to Los Angeles, I was like, because I didn't know a lot of the answers in school. Right. Uh, when people would ask me, oh, what's the answer to this? I didn't know. And I didn't want that to happen with music. And so that's why I study. And still today, you know, I practice so, so, so much that the, you know, the day will turn into night and I'll be like, oh, I better eat something or something. But I think what it really helps is it helps my mental state because like it occupies my brain so much to learn difficult things. Yep. And if I don't, I have these like ailments that happen to my body that are in my brain. And I think the guitar is the thing and music is the thing that kind of saved me from that. I think I could not identify with that more, that notion. And I've had a lot of people tell me that where it's that it's very appealing and, and I have so much respect, even in fields that I'm not in, where I'm like, that person's doing it at a high level, you know? And so I, I can understand how that could be such a major motivating factor for you. That's really cool. Um, I would ask you this as a, as a guitar expert, who do you put on the Mount Rushmore guitarist in your mind? Um, you know, I would say I would put, that's a, that's a fine question, because there's so many zillions of great guitar players that I love, but... I would say I would take Guitar Genius where they take an idea out of thin air and change the world with it. Something that's yes. never been done before, such as a, a Hendrix came along and changed the how the guitar was looked at. Absolutely. And then uh, an Eddie Van Halen came around and changed how the guitar was looked at. And then um, an Ingve Malmsteen who came and changed everything. And this is like... You know, these are these are guitar players that totally changed the game. And I would say um, also like a, another uh, picker would be Chet Atkins because he yeah he did something completely different where he was playing the bass part at the same time, and nobody's done that right. before, and that was really exciting for a lot of people. So that's. Uh, what, how many people are on? Four, 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 four. Yeah. So that's four. Yeah, All right. that's a good list. I <laughs> yeah. can't argue with that, especially when you talk about people who really changed the game. I know Van Halen had a huge impact on you. I'm going to jump around a bit in my timeline since you mentioned it. You get into a band with David Lee Roth. Yeah. Man, that's like your real, that's a real transformative break for you at that moment where you somehow find yourself in a freaking band with the lead singer of Van Halen. How does that happen? It was you know, I was always driven and I, I just wanted to always kind of do what I could to like go the extra mile. And I was like, I I had no fear and it's <laughs> crazy, which is insane. But I was sitting on my friend's couch and I was not doing anything. And I looked and I saw the crazy from the heat book and it had a number on the back and a mailing thing. And I just called cold and i said oh are you guys doing any like are you listening to any music right now and the guy was like um i think so and so we'll see and blah 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 you can send it so i did my best you know thing that i think dave would like and it really worked out well and he he just said uh their their management company said to send some more stuff dave likes it and i couldn't believe it and i mean i had no money and i just 
did every favor and I just kept on sending music. And they said, oh, Dave wants to meet you. And I couldn't believe it. You were spending money in the studio to get these. Yeah, yeah. Well, like wow. just my own money. I had no money, you know. Yeah. So I would, um, I was like doing every session I could for like no money. And I just saving up to do these songs. And Dave said, uh, oh, why don't you come to Dave's house? And this is where they did the Van Halen, like the photo shoots and the rehearsals and all this stuff. And I, what's funny is I knew where the house was because that's the famous house. And so I pulled up and I rang the bell and hello. And you could tell it was Dave's voice, you know, and I was because you know that voice. Totally. And I drive in and there he is in overalls and, you know, and he goes, John, great to meet you. We're going to do a record and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, my God, you know, my head was spinning. And, um, yeah, it happened so fast. Just, you know, it was incredible. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. And so... You know, is there a pressure to kind of performing and writing with him, you know, where it's like, this is David Lee Roth, you know, it's, it, it seems like with you, and I just want to say kudos on a lot of people really don't realize how much of a boost you can give yourself by just having balls and going for it. Yeah. You really are doing, you're going that extra mile. A lot of people aren't thinking to do that. If you're at home and you're listening, like take that chance because not a lot of people are, t people don't take enough risk in my opinion. Right. And you know, Life without risk is no life at all. And I really believe that because I could have never made that call, you know, and, and, uh, who knows, but every, I, I'll never look back on my life and go, man, I wonder if I should have done this because everything I thought of, I did. Yeah. And I'd gotten a lot of no's, you know, like, oh, I'm going to ask this girl out. No, oh, that's okay. You know, there's, you know, there's others and things like that. So I always took took that chance but with um the pressure with dave it was incredible because before we started he said if you can't do it in two takes you can't do it and this music was really intense like, you know and it was i was playing with halford at the same time and he dave is so smart he said i want you first so you so i don't get you when you're tired after rehearsal with halford so, so we started very early in the morning and we just did it live um, very early in the morning. I remember driving down the freeway and the sun was just coming up and I was, I'll never forget this. And I pulled up and, you know, and, and uh, we made that DLR record in, you know, less than two weeks mixed and mastered everything. So it was, it was, it was a lot of pressure and still today. If Dave's like, come on over, you know, we'll write some songs. There's still that, you know, that huge pressure. You know, right. Which I love. I love that I, I'm never comfortable, you know, and I think that, I think as soon as you're comfortable, it's, it's, it's not good. So fascinating to talk to you because your mindset is very similar to how I thought it would need to be for you to play the way you do. It takes so much practice, so much focus. One of the things that's really interesting about you, which is crazy to even say that, is you don't drink or do drugs. Right. And I don't even eat sugar. <laughs> I don't drink coffee. I don't do anything. Which, so. by the way, that is a major win. That is awesome. I, I, I totally love that. Have you gotten a lot of shit from people in all the years? <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm a vegan and everything. But the reason why is I'm on the road all the time i'm shaking hands and, because i never want to say no to somebody sure hey can i get a picture will you sign this i never want to say no so you're meeting all these people and i try to stay as healthy as possible totally. because i want to give these people a, a good show they save money just like i did to go see these early concerts you know and it's so important to them and i i want to give them the best experience possible with, along with meeting them and listening to their stories right. and listening to their comments and things like that. That makes total sense. Um, you know, talking about the people you met and worked with when you ventured out to LA, uh, exactly what year was that, by the way? Well, I'm sorry. When you first went to LA, mm -hmm. what year was that? It was, I think between like 88, uh, like right around there. Okay. So tell me if I'm wrong about this story. This is so cool. Around 88, around the time you first get there, you encounter another young guitarist who tells you that he happens to be, I guess this is at a house party or something, and you encounter this young guitarist who tells you he's Ozzy's new guitarist named Zach. So I was, 
I was in LA and I was, you know, I would go to LA a lot and I was in my friend's apartment right on uh, Fuller and Sunset. And, you know, they'd always have people over and I was in the, in the room, in the bedroom, just playing guitar, just like I do all the time. And this guy sticks his head in long hair, you know, straight hair, skinny dude. He goes, Hey dude. And then there was this Les Paul there and he picked it up and it, you know, it was, and we started jamming and, um, and it was great. And we were just playing and jamming. And I remember he cooked food and then he, we watched the movie Easy Money. Wow. With Roddy Nate Dangerfield. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, I'm the new guitar player for Ozzy Osbourne. And I was like, really, dude? He was like, yeah, man. I was like, God, that's awesome. Congrats. And I remember he gave me his number and all his stuff. And, you know, I called him up when he was in town with Ozzy. And it was incredible. No, it was, I remember vividly now. He was on the cover of Guitar for the Practicing Musician. Ozzy's new guitar player. And I was like, that's the guy. That's Zach. And he was so kind and, and just um, such a nice person, as everyone knows in the world. And, it, you know, it, it, it's just such a wild thing how life is, you know. And, and I remember that. It was such a great experience. That's amazing. And now you guys are really widely regarded as two of the best guitarists on the planet. And that's just crazy you guys met each other as you were kind of both emerging in right. music and what these two dudes that are sitting down watching easy money and cooking food yeah could both go out separately and independently of one another to do these amazing things i i, I read that and i was like that's crazy i remember i i don't i'm i, I wonder if zach remembers that i i i'm curious to, to if zach remembers that but there's a lot of funny stories i have like that with you know, the, with the Guns N' Roses guys or the Metallica guys, and I would just be there, or we'd hang out, and I'd play. And, like, they, the Metallica guys who I'm close to, they remember all this stuff. They're like, yeah, dude, we remember you, and now you're doing this and stuff. And so it's it's really funny how, how things happen. It seems, you know, and, and it really is a small community of musicians. It really and it's like a big high school in some ways. Yeah. So you're with David Lee Roth. Uh, this, I think, is another testament to you, how aspirational you are and how ambitious you are, which I love. Uh, you, you at some point learned that Marilyn Manson has openings for his band. You apparently go to lunch with him, and he hires you on the spot. Yes. I was in Europe with Halford, and I loved Marilyn Manson. Right. I love I, I during during the Katie Lang time I listened to Antichrist Superstar before we went on stage and I just loved it I loved Manson and so I took a break from Katie Lang and did some touring with Halford and I remember we were playing in Europe and we were opening up for Manson and I remember laying in my weird bus with. You know, like those European buses where the scene double deck yeah. right here and stuff. And I'm going, I finally get to see Manson because I was playing the Conan O'Brien show with some other artist. And I ran right after the Conan O'Brien show to see Manson and the show was over and I missed it. So I never got a chance to see him, but I was like, I'm finally going to get a chance to see him. I'm finally going to get a chance to see him. And then they canceled. And I was like, I was rushed. I was crushed, and so we went home. This was the end of the European tour. Went home, and my phone was ringing in my apartment. I ran in the apartment. I was like, hello, hello. You know, of course, before cell phones. And they were like, oh, my name's Tony Ciula. We're having problems with our guitar player. Mance would like to meet you. And I was like, of course. You know, I just landed. You know, I'll, I'll be right there. And we went to Gaucho Grill on Ventura, and... How it came about is because Halford was on Nothing Records with Trent Reznor's label. And Manson, I remember pulling up to the restaurant, and then I saw Manson's car, and it had the David Lee Ross CD and the Halford CD in it. Wow. And I was like, oh, that's a good sign, you know? <laughs> so um, I walk in, Wow. and he's got like the, the big sunglasses on, the red ones, and the red hair, and a lover boy shirt, and... He just was talking to me for a minute and he goes, I want you to be in the band. Your name's going to be John Five. 
and you're you know um we're gonna start our first show is gonna be the video music awards mtv video music awards and i was like um okay yeah why not you know life without risk is no life at all amen and i remember going home and <clears throat> practicing my autograph with the five and you know and all that stuff so the first time i got to see manson was on stage during that MTV Video Music Awards. So if you see that performance, I'm watching them a lot. Flame, <laughs> they like kind of like like looking around, like watching and stuff like that. So it was really uh it was really a great experience. That's amazing. Yeah, that and and you just look at your resume. So at some point you meet Rob Zombie. You encounter him. At this point, he's uh, a very, becoming a very successful film director as well. And, um, you know, there was a question of whether or not he's going to continue. And at some point, he meets John Five and goes, oh, shit, I got to work with this dude. Yeah, it's, it was, we were doing this benefit in, um, what was it, uh, for the tsunami uh, survivors and all that stuff. It was just terrible. Indonesia? Yeah, it was yeah, horrible. And so yes. we did this benefit and i said oh i want to like play a song with rob zombie because i knew he was going to be on there and so um we did and we played you know thunder kiss 65 at, at the um rehearsal and uh, he walked off like near the end of the song and i said if you ever need a guitar player let me know yelling it in his ear you know huh? as he was leaving i right. still playing you know, the end of Thugger Kiss, and as he's walking out, and I just yell in his ear. So at the benefit, we were sitting there talking, just like you and I are for a while, and we were getting, getting along very well. And the manager comes up and he goes, hey, why don't you give Rob a break? And I said, whoa. whoa. I go, okay, that's fine. I'm doing this. So I just went to like the other side of the room, and he was on the other side of the room, and we just both, both weren't talking. And... He was like, he was like, hey, remember that first time? This is like 10 years later. And he goes, remember that first time we met and we just, you just stopped talking and we just like sat on a episode. And I said, yeah, your manager told me to give you a break. And he goes, give me a break. If I want a break, I'd go, you know, I'd leave the room or something like that. But it was, it was funny, but it was. Do you um, think the manager was. Uh... I think that's just protecting Rob. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, like, oh, this guy keeps talking to Rob so much. Or something. I was wondering if maybe, and I'm just speculating, maybe he had another guitarist in mind. <laughs> no, no. He, it was wonderful because he wasn't even really, um, he was just making movies at that time. Right. And so he said, um, well, I'm going to do uh, OzFest. And it's only six weeks, so don't, you know, get too comfortable. It's only six weeks. And I was like, ah, that's great. And then... That those six weeks turned into, you know, how many years? 16 years or something right. like that. 16 you know. years. Yeah. And at this point, you're really, I mean, I saw you so many times with Rob Zombie, just probably at least 10. And it was always one of the things that's great about Rob Zombie is he always gave you so much time to shine up there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, what was it? What did it mean to you to kind of play with him for so long and have such an amazing run, which he's now bringing back a lot of these OGs and that's going well. And yeah, you've obviously got a great situation. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. You know, I just had the pleasure of playing those songs, you know, and we had the best time together. We loved being around each other. A lot of people don't know, but Rob is super clever, funny. Really? Like really clever, funny, <laughs> and I'm like, oh my god! So we we just had a great time on tour, making records, hanging out, and you know we never had a negative word. We really we never had a negative word. It was, I really we had Blasco on and just returned to the band. I love Blasco. Yeah, man. and he was saying, you know, he previously left the band. Yeah, and he said it wasn't even a negative thing. He's like, we just parted ways we were very professional and you know now he's back and so he seems like a very good pro and and i just puts on such a great live show yeah at some point so first of all how long have you known molly crew i let's see i met those guys i've known nikki the longest and i don't even know how long it's been but it is you know i'm really bad with years I, it seems like most of my life, I've known. Really, I've known Nikki. <laughs> um, 
we worked on a meatloaf song together, um, Bad Out of Hell 3, uh, we, The Monster is Loose. We worked on 6 a.m. together. We worked on, um, you know... Uh, God, they had some bangers too, man. 6 a.m. Yeah, yeah. Life is Beautiful. Life is Beautiful. What an amazing Yeah, track. And L.A. Rats, of course. Yeah. You know? So, you know, we've always worked in the dirt and all that stuff. Yeah. So we're just very close. And I've known Tommy and, you know, I was very close to Mick. Still am. Yeah. And we we talked and, you know, all the time and... and I would go see Molly and I'd be in Nick's room. Yeah. You know? And then I'd be like, oh, I got to go say hi to Nicky. I go say hi to Tommy. But what's funny is I never, I didn't meet Vince until I was in the band. Which really? Is, yeah. Isn't that amazing wow. how that people don't know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's yeah. amazing how that works. Yeah. Such a small. So we were at Tommy's birthday party in Mexico and Vince was there and you know, and we were introduced, and that was the first time I met him. I'm assuming you grew up really loving Motley Crue like everybody else. Yeah. You, know, you grew up listening to their music. At some point, you meet them, and it's a holy shit moment. One of the biggest bands ever. Um, and at what point, you know, how do they let you know, like, dude, we're going to bring you in? Well, it was, you know, um, they were on tour. They were doing the stadium tour, and... Mick was like, I'm going to retire. Right. And told the guys, listen, I'm going to retire. And, you know, I applaud that guy. He's absolutely the toughest guy I know. Yes. I mean, to play with that, with that disease, I mean, I applaud him and he's my hero. Yep. I mean, just to go through that every day. So he said he's going to retire and I, I applaud him. Like, right. I mean... What an amazing man. Um, but such Nikki a prolific called. writer, too. And you know. Yeah. Nikki called, and he's, and I was on the road with Rob. Because we talked, you know, eight times a day anyways, you know. And he goes, hey, dude, Mick just told us that, you know, he's going to retire. Do you want to come in and, and, and play? And I was like, absolutely, of course, you know. Do you go, I mean, inside, though, you've got to be like, oh, my gosh. It, I didn't believe it yet. <laughs> I, I, I just being honest. Yeah, no, I will ease you. I'm always honest when I do interviews. Yeah. I was like, I didn't believe it. So I was like, yeah, dude, you know, of course. You know, thinking, oh, like, you know, Mick's going to come back or like they figured it out or whatever like that. So I'm like, sure, dude. And so this was summertime and they still were doing some shows and I was finishing up with Rob. And I didn't even tell Rob yet because I didn't, you know, believe. Of course. You know, so we were just like, you know, months go by and, and Nikki's like, yeah, dude, this is going down. So they would talk to me and start getting things together. And like the tour manager would call me. I'm like, okay, it's getting a little bit more real and airline tickets and things like that. Okay. And then... The announcement came, and that was right around Halloween. Correct. And I told Rob, and I I was like, I guess it's true because all those headlines, boom, 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 boom. And, you know, Nikki was like, here's the set list. And I knew all the songs. You know, we all know the songs, you know. <laughs> so he's like, you practice the songs? I'm like, yeah, dude, I'm practicing the song. I knew the songs <laughs> since I was 15 years old, you know. <laughs> So, um, that's so cool. So when I got to rehearsal the first time I was so excited and I was, I was so excited and I, I had time to kill cause I was like an hour early. So I went to target, walked around did whatever. And I got the time wrong, which I don't know how I did. And he's like, dude, you're like 20 minutes late. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm like 40 minutes early. And he's like, what are you talking about? And they're all there. And I was like, oh, no. Oh, so I get, you know, I, we just start. And he goes, what do you want to start with? And I go, let's start at the top of the set. And we, no joke, we ran the whole set. Boom, boom, boom. And they have different intros, different endings. And I studied everything just like I do. Like, I just studied everything. And we did the whole show with endings, Tommy's hits, everything. Perfect grind. And it was just, and then 
we didn't we didn't even rehearse that much for the um first show in atlantic city i thought they would want to rehearse a lot and i was like this is great because i love playing those songs that you know just like anybody would and but we rehearsed only a few times you know and um got to atlantic city and i was just you know if you watch that video you know i'm just smiling ear to ear yeah. Because I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is really happening, you know? And it was just, it was so funny to me, you know? Because I couldn't believe it, you know? And it was just so weird, you know? That's when it really hit you. Yeah. You know, I'll believe the when I see it type situation to an extent. You know? Yeah. And then it started and playing and doing all this stuff. And Ace and Peter came, you know, from Kiss. And it was just to support. And I know you're a huge fan. Yeah. I'm trying to get the ace on the podcast right now. His solo album is kick ass. Yeah. Uh, so after the show, I had so much emotion. And everyone was like, that was great. That was great. I started bawling to Tommy. Uncontrollable. <laughs> like, it was so weird. It was like uncontrollable. I was like, what am I doing? Right. And it was just so much emotion. It was so weird. I bet you probably carry around a certain amount of pressure that you're better at dealing with than most people. And it just came unglued at that moment because you're like really there. It was, it was, it was, it was, uh, something to say. I mean, yeah. That's at the mountaintop. You know? Yeah. It was, it was really cool. It was something special. How many people you hadn't heard from in 20 years start hitting oh. Motley when you get Motley Crew? All the time. Yeah. All the time. All the time. It's just nonstop. Oh, I care, man. Which is wonderful. And I support it. And I yeah. ask everyone how they're doing and how they are and stuff like that. And, and make sure everyone's good. You know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I can't imagine how many people, um, would, would hit you up with that. That's just amazing. But I mean, it's just so cool to see you in that spot. I remember I was at, so, you know, I, I followed you for a long time and I was at, I think it was Aftershock, Rob Zombie comes out in place. I'm like, yo, hell yeah, John Five is about to kill it. And they come out and you're not there. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, this guy never misses shows. He died, do you get drink? You don't do drugs. You're in, a, you're in athletic shape. I'm like, that's not good. Something's going on. Yeah. And then within like a day or so, the picture started to really become clear. I think that announcement was made, I don't know, a short time after that. Mm -hmm. You know, I know the truth, the honest to God truth that happened. I told Rob, I said, Rob, I'll play these shows. It's no problem. You know, it's no problem. I'll play these shows. Right. And, you know, I never, ever in my whole career ever left anyone hanging. For sure. And I love Rob and I right. love those songs. So I was like, dude, I'll play those shows. No problem. And I played one. I played Louder Than Life. I think it was in right. I was that one too with Kiss, yeah. and that was my last show. And then there was Aftershock, and he was like, "No, we're gonna get rigs." And I was like, "Okay, if you want, I'm here." Right. You know, so because uh, I wasn't starting with Crew until you know months and months and right. months later. So, right. but you know, he's he's doing great. You know, Riggs is doing great, so it's wonderful. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it really did work out because for him, it appears that he's really got that OG lineup. Mm -hmm coming back into place and yeah and motley crew yeah i don't know how much you can share about the new music because yeah. i gotta tell you what we were nerding out about this on the way up here the new motley crew album first motley crew record in many years over a decade maybe yeah. 20 i don't know but you worked with bob rock yeah and this dude did the black album and right on so many huge huge records I mean, Bon Jovi and everything. Unbelievable. I, I mean, that that is just a mind-blowing producer when you go down the list and look at what he did for rock. I think the yeah. album to this day is selling off the shelves, selling physical copies. And, uh, you know, so what was that experience like getting in the studio? So now you're not just playing with them. You're also writing with these guys, and you're such a great writer. I I, I feel like I read somewhere that Nikki said this is going to be pretty heavy. I could be wrong about that. But no, what are you yeah. sharing about this? It's heavy. What What's funny is I remember, just like you coming to do this interview, you kind of think, oh, I know how it's going to go. Right. Okay, we're going to talk. We're going to this and that. And that's how I was going into the studio with these guys. I was like, okay, I kind of know it's going to be, we'll get in there. We'll play in the control room. Yeah. I was so wrong. <laughs> I We all got in the live room. And I was like, I, I, I haven't recorded 
in the live room with everybody playing at the same since Hollywood. Wow. And so we um, were all in the live room and I was like, oh, this is going to be rad. This is awesome. And Bob Rock was right in the center and, and you know, Nikki was here. I was there, Tommy. And, and it's like we a scene were, out of a movie. Yeah, it was incredible. And we all played at the same time. So what you're going to hear is us pretty much just playing live. Wow. And I thought that was so special. Right. You know, I really thought that was so special. And um, because I didn't think it was going to be like that. Right. And people don't really do records that way anymore, as you mentioned. There's so much, you know, cut and paste and all of that. Right. But, but so weird. And it, that's just how he, they, they did it with, um, you know, Dr. Feelgood and everything. Right. So it was so cool. It was really, it was really special. And the thing about Motley Crue is, you know, they don't just drop music. They've really been methodical throughout their career with, they're not doing a new album every two years. Right. So this is going to be a big deal when this new Motley Crue record comes out. And I know that, you know, the fans have such a, a high opinion of you and, and what you bring to the table that I think, while this is a big opportunity for you, you're also to a certain extent bringing new energy into the band, you know? And so I just think that's and really I, incredible. I think what's important is that I have such a respect and fondness for Mick. Right. And, and he's spoken highly of you. And, and, well. and I think that if anybody was going to do it, I think Mick would want me to do it because I love the music and I love Mick so much and I love his solos just like the world does. Right. And I think that's important. Um, I think that's really, really important because I, I hold him on such a pedestal. And what an amazing player and just a musician all the way around. And Absolutely. Just, and person. Yeah. And I'd see, you know, and I just, I thought that was really great where he's basically said that. And, you know, he's spoken so highly of you publicly. And I, I just have thought that, you know, what a classy person he is. And, and you know, you as well. It's obvious there's a very mutual fondness that you guys have. And, and it probably makes it a lot easier for you to step into this band with their retiring with, with people knowing that and understanding that, yeah. that Mick really does love John five. And, you yeah. know, uh, how, how did you meet him? You know, how did y'all, you met, he, he was one of the first members you met or was it Nikki? Uh, Nikki. And then, um, and then it was Tommy and then Mick. Yeah. But we were, you know, we, I, I mean, I played a lot with, um, Tommy on his recordings and I worked on his record. What, did you do like Methods of Mayhem and stuff like that? No, I did that. Some I, of those songs were heaters, man. Yeah, I did some other music for him. I can't remember what it was. And then I just worked on his last uh, solo record. And, you know, this was way, way, way before I was even in the band. And The Dirt, you know, I was working on, on The right. Dirt. And this was, you know, way before I was in the band and stuff. The Dirt is an amazing movie. I mean, yeah, really, it's, it's one of the best movies I think Netflix has ever put out. Was the Dirt? It's incredible. Yeah, it's incredible. It's gonna be one of those. It's gonna be one of those bangers that you watch, like Rockstar. That movie for me, with, right? Uh, yeah, you know, Kennedy in it at the end. Mark yeah. Mark, that's an incredible movie, and I, I do see some parallels. Like you know, your your life in some ways has been like a movie when you follow it. Yeah. You know, this kid growing up and and. But in your yeah, oh, oh sure oh, it's all good and I don't I don't take it for granted either I'm so happy and I'm so lucky and I'm so appreciative to be here yeah you know I just really I'm so happy to be doing what I'm doing and I never take it for granted ever and and not just that you're this elite musician who's a great guitar player it's that you've done it without the use of drugs and alcohol, which again, you know, I, I've, I've drank at times, whatever, but to it's difficult even, you know. Now, there's this story that I read pertaining to alcohol. You don't drink alcohol, you don't do drugs, but there was maybe one time that a certain legendary guitarist got you to do some shots with him. Yeah. Can you tell that story? I think this yeah, is so Yeah, yeah, cool. no. I, was, I know that you had to have so much respect for him to do that. You know, it was, yeah, um... We were always around Pantera and, Hell yeah. you know, we were always hanging out with those guys and I would always jam with Dime and, and do the, do picking with him. And, you know, it's just such a wonderful person, a great guitar player. And they knew I didn't drink or anything like that, but it's funny cause they never really pressured sure. ever. 
they were just like more for us, you know, because it was like that kind of thing. But like those videos you see, all that stuff was real. You know, they just, they, it was like New Year's Eve every night. So we were on the bus and it was like a thousand o'clock, you know, and we had to leave and the bus driver, the sun was coming up and they're like, we got to get to the next town. And Dime is like, I'm not leaving. I remember he had a Cadillac uh, SUV and I never saw one before. And I remember, you know, uh, seeing that and he's like, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving until five takes a shot with me because he knew I wasn't going to. So that was his thing to say, I'm not leaving. And he's like, he sat right down. Oh, well, you know, you know, Diamond, like he's, he's in the bunk. It's, he's sleeping. He's been sleeping. I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. So they had to get me up and I like get out of bed. Like, you know, just a mess. <laughs> and he goes, drink it, drink it. And I, it was like a little baby shock, you know, like a, like a child has a toothache or something like that. It was like that much. Right. And I drank it and it, it was awful. It felt like someone stabbed me in the stomach with like a rusty knife. It's something. nasty, honestly. Yeah, it was terrible. And so, but that was the only, that was the only time I ever had uh, alcohol. You know, it's, it's alcohol for me. It's just like, it was such an acquired taste like beer. At first I hated it. And then I'm like, okay, it's pretty good. And now, you know, I barely drink any of it, but um, the... It, for you, was there any part of it where you were like, was there something you saw? Like, did you see someone who maybe struggled with it? My parents and my family, they drank so much. So, 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 so much. And my friends and all that stuff. And I was like, I don't want to do that. I want to make sure I play guitar well and and really hone in my craft. So I never want to be belligerent, you know, or anything like that. But this is something that a lot of people don't know. Me and Dime were going to be on the cover of Total Guitar Magazine, and we were going to do the photo shoot. And this is uh, just right before, you know, uh, the incident. Right. And that's what we were going to do. And I have, um, you know, the early, uh, you know, information about us, where the photo shoot was going to be and stuff like that. So it was going to be me and him on the cover. Wow. Yeah. Such a heartbreaking loss that's still very much felt today. And, and you know, um, how did you first meet Dime and, and the guys in Pantera? I know they always kind of came around, but how far back did you go with them? I think it was, you know, during the Marilyn Manson, like 98 Marilyn Manson, or maybe even Halford, 97 and stuff like that. And Those guys went out to everything. Huh? They were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, they were the best. Yeah. They were the best, the best. And um, yeah, very early on, and, and you know, one of my absolute, you know, aside the legendary music, but one of my favorite things about the Abbott brothers is they were huge supporters of Nickelback. That says a lot about them that they really like what they like unapologetically, and they just seemed like amazing people. And it's just yeah, like I mean, I love Nickelback. I love the Dixie Chicks. I love you know anything. I just have such a fondness for music. Yeah. I love music. You have a lot of country influences. I want to kind of talk about that because I heard you, you know, we were setting up during soundcheck and you, you can hear a lot of country influences in your music. Like who are some of the country artists? I love country music. Who are some of the country artists you enjoy? Well, I love country music because of the, I mean, the guitar work is so complex. I yeah. mean, it is complex. Like that Chattahoochee riff? Is that more? Yeah. I don't know. Oh, man. It, all that stuff is really difficult. It's it's because you're playing both parts at the same time. And it's a total different way of looking the, at the instrument. Right. So it's, uh, it's, it's, I love Joe Maphis. A lot of people don't know who Joe Maphis is, but he was like the Ingve of country like guys in the early 50s. And, you know, Chet Atkins and, and Jerry Reed and Roy Clark and, you know, all these great, great, great players. And, of course, you know, we love Willie Nelson and yeah, uh, Dolly Parton. I just did a, you know, a song. You were on the Dolly Parton rock record? Yeah. So cool, man. Yeah, so rad, you wow. know. And I remember uh, driving to Reverse Road and I get a phone call. John, this is Dolly, and I wanted to say, I wanted to say, but I didn't have the guts. Dolly who? But I didn't have the guts. 
<laughs> I was like, hi, darling. Oh, John, I just wanted to call you. You did the finest picking on that record. I just wanted to call you and thank you so much. And I couldn't believe it because I love Dolly right. so much. Yeah, I know. Nikki's on that album too? Yeah, Nikki, yeah. you know, another thing that me and Nikki are on together, you know. So it's um, it's just such an honor to be in that you know, royalty. It's right. incredible. Incredible. When you look back mm -hmm. on your life, your resume, mm -hmm. how far you've come, mm -hmm. you know, in some mm -hmm. ways you're very aspirational, but is there a component of it where it, it blows your mind? I mean, you look at your resume. Mm -hmm. and I mean, David Lee Roth, and I'm, I don't leave a lot out, but you've got David Lee Roth, you've got Marilyn Manson, Rob Zombie, Motley Crue. I don't know how many people have a resume. You put that on paper, you're like, fuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is, you know, I've said it before, I've, uh, and I'll say it again because it's coming from the heart. It's very true. You know when you have those dreams and they seem so real? I feel like I'm going to wake up and go, oh, like turn to my, you know, like wife and say, God, I had this weird dream. I was like this guitar player and I played for all these people, you know, and maybe when I woke up, I never even played guitar. Right. Maybe I just was a teacher or something of like history or something. It's and that surreal. it's because it's not when you're a little kid and you dream of certain things. My dreams didn't even go that far. Right. My dreams were here in a, a realistic form. Right. I never thought, oh, I'm going to be this. Never. Not once. Right. I didn't think I'd ever sign an autograph in my life. You know, so it's and you were initially pursuing, as you said earlier, that that job as like a session guy. Yeah, that's all I wanted. I just wanted to like be a session guy, play, and then go home. What would you say to any musician that's tried to make it in a big way in the industry? I know there's a lot of differences now, but you know, I think that you have certain unique advice about the way you went about things that maybe you could share. I would say, you know, it's, you're right. It's so different nowadays, but I would say, first of all, be great at what you do, be great at what you do and really try to be a good person because you have to live with these people. You have to live and you know, you're a guest, you're a guest in these people's house, you know? meaning a band, be respectful, be nice, you know, and I think that's another thing. And just study and work. And if you work hard enough, you will get there. Look at and put yourself online, Instagram, YouTube. If you're great enough, you will be a sensation because the world is watching, right? The world is watching. Look at what happened to, you know, the journey singer, right? He was singing karaoke, you know? And they found they were like, too. that guy's really good. And he was on YouTube. Yeah. So be on YouTube and get, hone your craft and, and just be great. Right. Uh, what's some of the best advice you've ever gotten? Um, probably, probably that advice, you know, just be a good person. Treat people how you want to be treated. And that's how I've always done it. He worked with Conan. And what's interesting about Conan, I remember when he signed off of his uh, original NBC show for the final time, he said, you know, and he was speaking to like little kids that were watching. And I was, you know, I was pretty young at that time. I think I was a teenager. And um, I'll never forget. He was like, you know, I just want you guys to know if you're watching, like, if you work hard and you're nice to people, good things will happen in your life. It's you know, true. And I, I'd really, I've tried to model that as well for myself. And even like with my channel, you know, uh, it's, it's been mind blowing. Um, like, oh, yeah. It's, it's like the, the guys of Manson, the band, like Twiggy and Pogo, you know, they were awful to me and I didn't understand. They're like trolling you. They were just like, I don't know why, but like, cause we were all on the same team. Right. So I didn't know why they were so terrible. Right. Cause I just wanted to make things right. as great as possible. Right. 
And uh, it was, um, I didn't understand it, but I just, you know, did the whole killing with kindness thing. Like, right. Well, I mean, I, I think there's a level of probably hazing that seems to go on with people. Which I don't understand. Right. If I brought someone in my band, I would want to make them feel as comfortable as possible. Right. Say, have a great show. Don't worry about it. Right. If anything's wrong, let me know. That's what I would do. Right. I, I, I mean, it's just kind of common knowledge. Right. No, I totally agree. Uh, so I'm assuming with that, the, the, the Motley Crue guys didn't haze you into the band. <laughs> Bro, no, no, no. Like, we're all, because we're such good friends. Right. Like, like, Nikki's like my best friend. I like talk to him all the time. Right. So it was, it's very weird. Like, because we would have these, um, fly everywhere in like a private plane and I, I right. hate private planes I'm not bragging at all I right. hate private planes I've heard people say that they're actually scary because they move a lot more than commercial yeah. planes so but they love it they'll yeah. take a they'll take a plane to like you know 30 minutes down the road they'll be like oh well, let's get in the plane and, yeah. but so we would take a plane and we'd land it and then there would be four SUVs and so we'd all be in our SUV and drive it to the hotel or the gig and I'd text Nikki, I'd be like, hey, what are you doing? And like, you know, oh, I'm just riding. And everybody would be texting each other. And I was like, this is kind of dumb. Like, <laughs> like, and then we ended up all squeezing in one SUV, you know, me, Vince, Nikki and Tommy, and we'd all be in one SUV and there'd be three empty SUVs in back of us. <laughs> and, um, but that's how much we get along and how much we really enjoy each other's company. Yeah. And that's amazing. And I can tell, you know, at this point in their career, they're not going to bring somebody on that isn't not just a talented musician, but, you know, I've said this so many times, like, you made so much sense for Motley Crue. Like, nobody made more sense than you. Guy is the best at what he does. He's just extremely good. And then you're also easy to get along with and you don't have to worry about the guy being in a a drunken mess or you got to ready. You're gonna show up on time unless you miss on a cake. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Which by the way, I mean I always shit my pants. Yeah. If that if that I wonder I, I, I don't know if they'll even remember that. Maybe they will, but <laughs> uh, it's like I could I could I couldn't believe it. Like what is this dummy, you know? So oh it was gosh. funny, yeah. Well, John, I I don't wanna hold you. I know you've got a show coming up which we're very much looking forward to seeing. You have always been so cool, and I really appreciate you coming on the show. This has been one of my favorite episodes I've ever shot, and Thank you. I think you're where you're at for a reason, and uh, which in you a ton of success, and I can't wait to see you play with Bobby Group. Thank you, and I want to say I think what you're doing is wonderful as well. I really enjoy your Thank show, you. and you know your the news that comes up, and your your all your. I think you're very professional, and. Um, I really enjoy it. I think you're doing a great job. I appreciate that. I really try to be y'all. Check out John 5. I've linked all things John 5 and Motley Crew at the link in the description.